as next speaker doesn't really need much of an introduction, does he? Um, you've either seen him awkwardly hugging people. If you've never seen that, you just saw it. Okay, right here. That's his MO. He is a prolific awkward hugger. He's also the InfoSec Ranger for a Pony Express. He's just an all-around positive guy in the community and somebody who I consider a good friend. So war uh, help me warmly welcome Jason Street. You're awesome. Hey, Hope they heard that. Okay, hold on a second. I gotta do this. Just in case anybody you know suffers from epilepsy, this is not good. There we go. Oh my god. I literally almost just saw like an endorphin rush with that just like came off me. It's like wow. Okay. Um, I need this. Hello. Hi, everybody. How's it going? Um, so, uh, thank you for coming here. As you can tell from the uh, the talk title, this is a talk on failure, and uh, it's one of the, it, it really came about in a really weird way. Uh, last year, uh, Chris was uh, awesome enough to have me here last year doing a talk called Breaking in Bad. Where and you know what it was about? It's about me being awesome. I mean, let's face it, I talked about like, oh, I broke into this place, and it's like, oh, here's video of this and how I got in here, and wow, amazing, right? And it made me start thinking about other things, right? Isn't that in a lot of talks that you see, you get the A reel, right? You get like, oh, this is amazing, and nothing bad happened while I was researching. You know, it was just all good. So I said, screw that. I'm doing a talk this year, and it is nothing but my fails. Failures that I've done. And not cool fails like, you know, oh, I accidentally left an orange out and invented penicillin, you know? <laughs> not like I, oh, I tried how to create a filament with a light bulb while I was destroying Tesla and created the light bulb, you know? Not like that. It's literally just, I cratered and failed and don't do these things, it will be in badly for you. Um, you know, it's a feel-good talk, so it's all good. Um, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about a couple of them. Um, like I, uh, a lot of people, unfortunately, know way too much about me already, and you know that's my fault. Um, but the key thing is, I failed. That's if you want to know more about me, it's like I'm very comfortable with acknowledging that because through my failures, I've learned so much, and through my failures, I've been able to connect and create even better victories because of them. Uh, so I don't hide my failures. It's like I acknowledge them and like, you know, hey, straight up, this is, this is what happened. So uh, that's, the only, I mean, I'm, I'm a success, I mean, I mean, I'm great at failures. It's like, I mean, I, I, if I could fail at failing, it's like I, I wouldn't be able to happen, you know? It's like I'm, I'm a winner at it. Um, so luckily it's not a profession because then I would probably fail at that. Uh, and one of the other things I have to say, I'm very comfortable with this because since this whole talk is on failure, if I bomb or screw it up, that's the talk, so it all works out, right? This is a win-win situation for me. It's amazing, so I love it. Um, what we're gonna talk about, though, is I'm gonna discuss two red team fails, two blue team fails, and two uh, community fails uh, that I've done. And I'm gonna jump right into it. Um, the first fail was one of my first, uh, no, my first job as an information security professional. I was a network security administrator for this uh, online bank area. They're bankrupt, so I don't have to worry about not saying their name. But uh, I was the network security, you know why I was the network security administrator? Because the guy let me choose my title and I wanted the initials NSA. It's like I'm the NSA here. It's like you need to watch out. Um, I was horrible uh, because I had started out in physical security and law enforcement. And that is a totally different ballpark because security there and physical security, you know what you're doing? You're dealing with people that every day it is the worst possible day of their life. Either something horrible has just happened to them, so you're there, or something's about to have horrible happen to them because you're there. Either way, it's pretty horrible. So you get this jaded persona of like where you're, you're not wanted, you're not welcomed, and, and people that you're dealing with are suspect because something bad can happen if you don't distrust them. 
So when I started, and I was in IT, it's like doing help desk, doing the computer stuff, because that was amazing. I got burned out, and well, a lot of things led to the fact that I gave my, my notice on, uh, on the uh, task force because it was just really bad. And I loved and relished doing the help desk and doing computers because then I could be me. I could be the silly guy, I could be the big kid. It was amazing. But then when I got the job as network security administrator, it changed. And I was like, look at all these suspects at their terminals. I don't know what they're doing, but they're doing something, you know? So I would walk around. And it's like, and one of the things that we used to do is badge check to make sure you had your badge properly. If you didn't have your badge, company policy dictated that you went to the receptionist and got a temporary badge and you had to wear that the whole day. It wasn't the cone of shame, it was just good security procedure, good policy. So I'm walking through on a Monday, and I'm walking by doing my little badge check, and I see the CEO of the company, and he's in his office, and he's facing sort of away from me at the desk, and I walk by and say, hey, what's going on? And he's like, and he's not normally, you know, hey, Jason, what are you doing? He's like, I'm doing great, how's it going? Spider sense tingling, it's like, I look back at the door, you don't have your badge, do you? And he literally like, no. <laughs> and I'm like, come with me. And I walked the CEO, owner of the company, to the receptionist so he could wear a visitor's badge all day. <laughs> was that a victory for me? No. That was a victory for him that he believed in the policy so much that he went with it even when some weirdo was telling him to wear a badge. That was on him. That wasn't on me. It's like, so I was always like that. I was always like trying to check to see, making sure, because everybody was trying to do something. Everything was suspicious. And so I had a very confrontational relationship with a lot of the users. Instead of being someone there that was going to help them, I was someone to avoid. And usually now people just do that, you know, cons and stuff, you know. So, but this was like my job. People were like trying to do that. And that, was, that wasn't helpful. So I got really upset about that. And, and the, the epitome and the reason, this is the most poignant slide that I have because I received by the board of directors for this company, they one day for a birthday present, they gave me a picture like that. It had the, that exact picture of Barney Five, and it said Five Security Agency, and something else or something, we're gonna nip it in the bud or something funny, right? And had that, um, and I put that on my wall. It was like, I am literally so bad sometimes at human interactions that it took me two years before I realized, oh, they meant that as an insult. They're saying that's who I remind them of. That wasn't to be nice. It's like, so, I mean, because that's what they considered me. That's who they saw me as, a caricature of someone that was supposed to be doing security. How serious were they going to take me when an incident actually occurred? It's like, so it was a huge fail. And they kept coming, so don't, don't worry, we're going to keep going. Um, now, the next one is where it says, uh, what do we learn from it? I'm not just going to tell you about the fails because, you know, who wants to have time for that? So I've got some lessons that I've learned that hopefully that you can learn as well from it. So, that, you know, like a wise man learns from his uh, smart man learns from his mistakes. A wiser man learns from the mistakes of others. So I'm going to make you guys super wise by the time this is over. I promise. OK, uh, so one of the lessons that I learned was you got to cultivate relationships. You can't just appear when something bad happens. The users have to know that you're working. The users have to know that you're there to help protect them, protect their assets. Your job is to help them keep their job. Because if you're doing a good job of protecting them, then guess what? They get to still keep having money. They still get uh, expanding. They still get to do their business. Because if they get hacked or they get breached or they get compromised and they go under, they no longer have a job. You need to show them how their vested interest is in being part of security. The next thing is you got to foster the image of being part of the solution, not part of the problem. You've got to understand exactly how creative users are. I hate people talking about stupid user did this, stupid user clicked on a link. No. Take solitaire off an employee's computer. See how quickly that mother comes back. OK? See how quickly that comes back on the system with these computer illiterate users, OK? They will find a way. So instead of creating an environment where they're actually trying to help you, they're using your, their creativity to circumvent you. And that doesn't help anybody. Now, empower employees to get involved with what you do. Talk to them. 
have lunch and learn lessons. Show them how they can be part of the solution. Uh, they're part of the information security team already. From day one, they should realize that one of their job responsibilities is information security. And if they don't, that's one of the things that you need to be teaching them as well. So do that. It's like get that kind of relationship. So when they see something suspicious, they'll report it to you. I have a guy. He's a great guy. I love him to death. Uh, he sends me spam. No, you need to understand this. I have a spam rule for my spam rule to get the spam that he spams me with, okay? He has gone to the point of actually sending me spam from his home email address at home just to make sure that this is a new campaign. It looks like it's coming out. I just wanted to give you an FYI. I have set it up that about every 500 to 1,000 emails I get from him, I'll reply back with, oh, that's a new one. Thank you very much. That's a good one. Thanks for sending it to us. And his reaction is like, I'm part of the security team. I just helped them out, which is what you want. You want them to be part of the security team. You want them to feel that, that they're part of it. I effing hate his emails. <laughs> he will never know that because he gets to talk to his other employees and tell them how he's part of information security. Their first response is, wait, we have an information security team? What? And then he gets to talk to them and train them. So that's how you do that. So the next one, um, this is a whole, I literally, when I was giving this talk and I, I, re, I brought up this one, I actually got too much into the moment and actually started turning red because it's so embarrassing. This is like one of the worst fails I've ever done in my, well, not really, professional fails that I've ever done. I got to be specific on this. It's like, there's been a lot, but professionally, this is one of the worst ones. So... I have a computer at my desk. It's like, and I watched the uh, firewall logs. This is a, uh, this company that I worked with. And I had a computer set up where I was watching the firewall logs like a soap opera. You know, I could tell when something was going on. It's like I was looking for the red. I was like seeing IP addresses, where they were going. And then at one moment, one day, a flood of telnet connections going to internal IP addresses from other internal IP addresses. I freaked up out, okay? Thanks for that message there. So I freaked out, I was like, what is going on here? It's like, uh, so I was like freaking out. I was like, what am I gonna do? It's like, I jumped up, you know, leapt up, you know, I didn't even put my cape on and stuff, you know, cause that's usually how you're supposed to do these things. And it's like, and I ran over to the networking team. And I told these guys, I was like, seriously, what's going on? It's like, we've got this attack. It's like, what's this IP address? What's going on? And I'm like freaking out. And my boss wasn't there uh, at the time, which, you know, he's la learned to regret later. Uh, and I was trying to figure out what was going on. They're saying, that's an IP address from one of our routers. I'm like, oh, my, they're inside. We've got internal APT going on. I'm, I'm like, cyber, everybody drink. This is bad. Okay. So I literally go to, the, I, I can't report it to my boss. So what do I do? I go to the CIO of the company, my boss's boss. You know, he loves me, right? And I told him, like, this is what's going on. We need to respond to this. This is an instant response. We go, and so I go back to the networking guys. I'm like, well, hey, what else is going on? What's here? The, we're trying to track it down. We're trying to look, and it's jumping. And it's like, it's like, you know, quick, bring up the visual basic, and we'll do a trace rod on them or something. You know, it's like, it was horrible. I was freaking out. 15 minutes into this fiasco, one of the network engineers raises his hand. Um, could that be that scan I'm doing uh, for all the Cisco routers in the network? <laughs> and I'm like, Mother couldn't you have said that just a little bit sooner? <laughs> and the CIO is looking at me like, couldn't you have waited just a little bit later? And I'm like, so it was horrible. It was a bad, I was embarrassed because it's like I totally created this whole drama and it's like, and it's not even the cool drama that I usually start. This was like bad drama. And I just, it was bad. And it's like, I looked, I'd lost respect in the eyes of the CIO. It's like, I didn't have that much respect with the engineers anyway, so they didn't care. It's like, and that was on me. They could have told me right at the very beginning what was going on, I'm pretty sure. I could have taken the moment at the very beginning to instead of ignoring all the other engineers and just go to their supervisor, I could have helped avoid that. I mean, because we treat, you know, security and networking, you know, they're like, we gotta, ooh, I, we gotta slow everything down. We gotta slow everything down to inspect the traffic. No, we gotta speed things up. We gotta worry about our bandwidth. So it's a constant fight. 
I mean, I literally, it's like when I go over to the networking side and stuff, you know, and I have to go do something in the networking uh, part of the cube, I'm telling my boss, like, look, here's my safe word. If you hear anything coming from me, if I'm not back in 15 minutes, call the black choppers. You know, it's like, because I'm going into enemy territory here. It's like, but that's not the right way to do it. It's like, that doesn't foster a proper relationship. We need to create uh, listening, not just telling. I only went over there when I needed to tell them about a firewall rule they needed to make. I needed to check an IP address. I needed an uh, IDS rule signature uh, done. Something like that. When it was just, I just needed them when I needed them. There was no relationship. There was just total animosity because, you know, I could be a jerk sometimes, believe it or not. You're supposed to act like y'all don't believe it. You don't have to be so accepting of, of that fact. Okay, we'll go on. So, thank you. So, uh, you have to develop an invective communication channel before crisis. So, this is sounds strange coming from a guy in information security, but go talk to him without having to need anything. Start up a conversation. I mean, let's face it. They're geeks, just like you. And you know what they like, just like you, because they probably have, you know, Firefly action figures or, you know, Batman versus Superman. They've got some kind of action figure telling you what they like. Look at that. Find a common ground. Okay? So you can find something interesting that you can talk to them with. Go on a lunch or something, maybe. Do something like that. It's like, get that kind of involvement going on. Um... The next thing is to develop an effective before they go, and then all aspects of the situation. Just okay, yeah. That next one is just straight out me. Don't leap to those assumptions. You know, if I would have spent just a little bit more time trying to figure out what was going on before I, I mean, literally, I was like sounding the alarms, ringing the bells. I mean, I was lighting the fires of Gondor and stuff. You know, it's like just making everything go down, right? It's like if I would have just waited on that that incident wouldn't have occurred. So you have to understand, you can't just jump. It's like you gotta look every once in a while. Uh, and I have a lot of problems with that, but usually it's good when I'm doing the red teaming part, it's, it's okay. Um, speaking of the red teaming side, um, I don't usually like having a rapist on my slide deck and stuff, you know, um, especially if he's convicted. Um, I don't even like having alleged rapists unless they're privacy advocacy or IPv6. But uh, red teamers always use this slide. Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. You know why? It sounds cool. So I can't, it's like, and I've, I've been a red team. I've never gone into a, an engagement with a client like, hi, I'm part of the red team. Booyah, where's the plan? <laughs> that doesn't seem to work. Okay? But when I started out in red teaming, I thought that's what I had to do. Not physically punch people in the face, okay? It's like, wouldn't have been a red teamer for long. I thought I was in there to go in there and tell them all the things that were wrong with them. It's like, I mean, literally, day one, I'm there talking to people. It's like, hi, I'm here how to tell you, show you how ugly your baby is. I mean, I haven't really seen your baby yet, but it's an ugly baby, okay? It's like, I mean, we're just gonna, all we're gonna do is just go over all the different facts about how ugly your baby is. It's not the ugliest baby in the world, probably, okay? But it's gonna be pretty darn ugly, just get used to it. And of course, everybody welcomed me with right warm arms and just, you know, open, you know, that was a great example, right? They loved me. No, but I thought that's what I needed to do because I had to verify, I had to prove to myself that that's who I am. I had to prove to myself that this is the guy that I am. It's like, because if I didn't actually totally pwn you and destroy your network, well, then I wasn't as good as you wanted or that you paid for. I have very low self-esteem. It's like, this is something that I personally was invested in. It's like, I had to come in and destroy you so I would feel good about you paying me. So it's literally, you know, hi, boom, pay, and I leave. So I got very confrontational. I had a lot of people very confrontational because some people, I'm, this is going to surprise, some people don't like their, being told their baby's ugly. I mean, who knew? You know, I was, I was but it's true. Believe it. And um, so there was this one incident where I was doing this work for this one company, and this guy was a jerk, okay? Trust me, not as big a jerk as me. I, I always win. But it's like he was a jerk. 
always giving me attitude, always doing these things to just try to be annoying, working around things. He was the client, you know, but it was his bosses, bosses, bosses that hired us to show where there might be failings about how bad he screwed up. And, uh, and we found one. It was a good one. Um, he liked to use a certain password. And the funny thing is, is when you drop the domain, uh, domain controller and you get all the hashes of all the passwords and you crack them all, you're able to actually get what his password history was too. So he used a variation of that same word. So what was funny was during a call with his boss and boss's boss and our uh, boss, I played this game of trying to find a way to work that word into the call. <laughs> it wasn't a common word, but it was effing hilarious during that conference call. Because I didn't want him just to realize that we got all this stuff. I wanted him to know we got all this stuff. So guess how many times I got hired back to that company? Zero. Because I was an a-hole. I was a jerk, I was difficult to deal with, and I took it too personally, trying to prove my point that I was better than him. And that made me suck bad. Not from professionally, but trying to actually educate them. How much did he learn from me? How many vulnerabilities did he really actually take to heart or understand? He didn't learn anything, but I'm not hiring that guy again. He's an a-hole, whatever. All the findings that I came up with were invalidated by my attitude. I screwed that up. That's a bad thing to do. So once again, I hate saying this. This is actually a good um, uh, quote from a guy who, you know, once he no longer had a plan, he bit someone's ear off. Uh, but everybody uh, you fight is not your enemy, and everybody that helps you is not your friend. Which is actually sort of apropos. That's what you have to convey to your clients. You are fighting them, but that's not be it's not because you're an enemy. You're trying to show them the weaknesses so they can get defended and protected against real criminals, real people that are trying to attack them. So you face the fact that if you're not part of the solution, then you're the problem. I didn't teach that guy anything. It's like he didn't learn anything effectively, except for who else to call besides me. Not Ghostbusters, but somebody else. And so, and allies come in unlikely forms and from unlikely places. After I learned that lesson, I started getting the team involved. I started talking to them. It's like telling them, it's like, look, I'm here. I know you know some of the vulnerabilities. I know that you're trying to get them fixed. And guess what? I'm here. I'm a third party voice to help get your frustrations and your fixes to management to help you get those fixed. I'm here as your advocate, not your adversary. That's amazing. I have literally had clients on an engagement, one of the engineers told me, he's like, by the way, um, if you go check over on the subnet, we've got this old uh, SNMP server that's not supposed to be running. It's like it's supposed to be in dev, but they won't change it and they may want to take a look at it is all I'm saying. You know, never would have found that. But I helped him and by helping him, he helped me. And more importantly than anything else, he helped his company be better secured and better protected because of that. So do that. And also short-term satisfaction often leads to long-term headaches. Like I said, if I kept doing that attitude of that engagement, I would not be standing up here. I'd probably be in a bread line in San Francisco or something because that's a cool place to hang out and stuff when you're homeless. But still, that's where I'd be. Because I would not be working here. No one would want to hire me. It's like, so yeah, you can get that short-term factor. Yeah, I punched him in the face. And guess what? No plan. They didn't have one. Yay, you're cool and unemployed. So you have to understand that. You have to be an advocate for them, not just an adversary. Now, this next one uh, that comes in is really crazy uh, because this literally... I'm really slow sometimes, okay? I'm a little thick. But on all my fails, this is the one that actually came to me in the middle of the engagement. I realized, oh, I could be doing this. 
So I was on this engagement with this client where they had a secured area. I mean, it was really secured. Uh, but there was a door going this way and a door going that way, or like this way and that way. Okay, I, the mics are like really weird for me. So, you know, for a guy who likes to go like all oh, this all the time, this is uh, annoying. Um, sorry, Chris, still love you. No, 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 no. Don't, don't get mad. So I had a, a, a door coming out of a hallway here, a door coming out of a hallway there, and then right here is this glass door coming in. So what I want to do is I want to look like I'm coming from one door and going to the other door so someone will let me in. So I do the half step. Half step's very cool. It's like this. You know, you, you'll stand like this. And you wait till someone to come in. And then you start and you're already in an actual gate. Because if you're like hiding behind a corner and you're stopped, your gate's a little off. It's like then if you were just naturally already walking through a door. So I did this half step for about five minutes. It's better than yoga, promise me. Uh, and um, someone walked in. And I walked in behind her. She looked at my badge. And she knows something was a little off. And I don't blame her. It said Gregory D. Evans, Oopsie Inc. So that could be a warning label. It's like I do come with them. And, uh, and I had the face on the badge actually had me going like this. <laughs> so yeah, you should know something's a little off. And she opened the door, but she let me in. She went right, I went left, went to the first office, pwned them. Went to the second office, pwned them. Went to the third office, pwned them. You know? I come out of the third office and guess what? She's down the hallway talking to somebody. I can tell by the body language and the expressions that she's upset and concerned and she knows that she did something wrong. And that's when I had the epiphany. I was, I can walk right out of the door right now. I have compromised three machines. I have successfully punched them in the face. Okay, I have shown them a failure. I have shown them a flaw. I have shown that I can actually compromise machines. I've done my job. And then I could, and I'd be gone. And then I thought, but what if I keep going and let her catch me? What would happen if I give them the win? What would they learn then versus a report later? And that is the day that I stopped doing red teaming and I only do social uh, engineering and security awareness engagements now. I no longer do red teams because you know what I did? I walked down that hallway. I said hello to her. She did not say hello back. That was pretty rude for the, just uh, for the record. And it's like, and she goes, and it's like I walk into another person's computer uh, 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 cube uh, office thingy, and I pwn them. You know, it's all good. Less than a minute and a half later, this guy just like barrels in. You know, he was ex Air Force. I found out later. It's like, what are you doing here? Let me see what he's doing. You're not able to do it. And I'm like, oh my God, I regret this decision. You know, it's like, I'm like, I'm, and I'm like, I'm literally like, as fast as I can, I'm actually even putting the real get out of jail free card out. I'm like, look, I'm supposed to be here. You're supposed to call. This. I'll call the number. You don't need to tell me the number. I know the number to call. It was their chief information security officer. So he's sort of on to me. And, um, and they won. And they learned. And she was empowered to do that again. All their employees were empowered to do something like that again when they see someone in an area they're not supposed to be familiar. I will go into an engagement and I will do the best to destroy you, I promise. I will be doing the best to try to compromise your people, destroy your buildings, and ruin you financially, okay, to the best of my ability. On the last day, I promise you, I will try to get caught. I will spend the whole day trying to get caught by your employees, to give them a win, to give them something to look up to, not all the things that they need to stop doing and look down at. And it's like, so, thank you. And one of the funniest ones of trying to give someone a win, and this was literally, I, quit, I don't know sports ball very well, but it was literally like a guy trying to like go through, a, uh, get a touchdown, and all the little leaguers are, are like climbing on him, and then like right to the last part of the goal, he falls down. Like, okay, you got me. Because I was at this bank, and I'd already compromised it. I already got in there, and I was trying to get caught. And so I'm literally sitting behind the teller line, and I'm bored. I got bad HDHD, okay? So it's like I'm like totally freaking bored here because no one's catching me. I'm totally freaking sketchy. I should be caught by now. So I tap on the teller's shoulder and I say, 
what's the user ID and password for this machine? It is a banking server that is actually doing business right then and there, processing stuff. He tells me the user ID and password. <laughs> the user ID is the same as the password, which was the same as the machine. By the way, yes, that was a finding later, okay? So I log into it. I do a graceful shutdown of the server that is conducting business for them. I unplug it and I start taking it out to the thing. And I'm thinking, maybe they'll start understanding something's going wrong, okay? And I get to the teller line and the guy goes, maybe something's going wrong. And he stops me and he's like, excuse me, sir, what, what are you doing? And I literally had to physically restrain myself from saying the top five things that I knew would say that would get me out of the building anyway, right? It's just instinct. It's like I knew if I would say it, he'd be like, oh, okay, go ahead. It's like, so I had to stop. And as soon as he said that, I was like, oh, you got me. Oh, you were good. How did you know I was a bad guy? You're all, you were, I mean, you gave me the user ID and password, but you were just checking to see if I was sketchy or not. Very good. You're awesome. What's your name? We're going to report how well you did. You're an example of what's right in security awareness. You just, you were great. You need a, maybe response time needs to work just a little bit, okay? <laughs> but you're good. So I gave them that win. And that doesn't diminish what I do. It helps them do better. And that's, at the end of the day, is what it's about. You gotta give your target a win and it doesn't diminish your attack. You gotta, your servers don't respond to an attack with a resentment, people do. You know, I have never had a server when I'm in the middle of a compromise and stuff, you know, I don't like this anymore, blue screen to death. <laughs> okay, I've had some do blue screens to death, but I don't think I was personally hurting their feelings. That's just how they do, right? So you don't have that, but humans do, and they will react that way. You can't just go in with the red team and just break everything and expect everybody to be happy with it or respond well to it. Um, now, also, when you look at the blue team as a teammate and not an adversary, you both win. If you go in saying we're part of the same team, trying to help you better, listen, one of the key things that you have to understand if you think that your red team and your job is to show red, uh, blue team how they failed or, show, or beat blue team or defeat them in their, their things, it's like you failed. You are hired by that company to help them be better secured, period. They don't care about how many O days or how many pump, oops, there we go. See, that's what I get for like doing the thing, getting all excited. It's like they don't care about how, uh, adversary you want to be, they want to be better protected at the end of the day. And if you leave that engagement with just a win and not them better protected, give up your job. You're failing. So, but this is about my fail, so we'll keep going. So, sorry, I get ranty. It's like it's been a long weekend already, so I'm a little ranty. So this next one is um, really personal to me because it's been happening a lot in this community, and uh, this is a community fail, and it's a, it's a little switch up, because I've, it's evolved on how I thought about it, how things have been going on. But I wanna start out with one important thing. I started off this uh, at the very beginning of the year when I gave a version of this talk. I talked about a guy who was the technical editor of my first book who plagiarized his section of the book, and nearly, I mean, when, you look, when I look at the things that have happened to me in my life that are horrible, and it's like, he is above cancer, right below my father's death, and he's like above me being homeless. It's like, he was a horrible man. And when I first gave this talk, I didn't name him, because I didn't want to give him credit, or I didn't want to make it recognized. And that turned out to be a fail, because I realized there's a difference between being wronged and being upset. There are people at this conference who hate me. They don't like me. They say all kinds of crap behind my back. And I'm, and I'm not being joking, I'm serious. I know who they are, I've heard some of the things. And there's probably some I don't even know about that don't like me, that stupid awkward hugger guy, you know? They don't like me. And they say bad things about me. I don't care. They're just being bad. Dustin Fritz wronged me. He did something wrong that damaged me. He needs to be named. When someone wrongs you, no matter who they are 
or what community they are and what standing they are in the community, you need to speak out and say something about it because they're probably wronging somebody else too. That's what needs to change. So if someone doesn't like you, re retweet it to Drama Llama, okay? That's just life, it's gonna happen. But if they wronged you, let people know and speak out on it. And so my fail, and I try to do that as my fail, I thought that was my fail, not like naming them and just going through and trusting them too much. But I realized later that wasn't my fail that I should be talking about. After my book came out, there was a guy locally in, in my city uh, who said something really horrible on LinkedIn, because you know LinkedIn's a great social network that you can get your feelings hurt on. And uh, he said this really bad thing on the review about my book. And it was the day of a uh, DC meeting. And I was pissed. I mean, I, it really hurt my feet. I'm used to people saying bad things about me anonymously online, because I mean, it's, it's the internet. You're supposed to not read the comments. That's one of the rules, right? It's like, so I was really upset with them. And I get to the meeting, and as soon as I open the car door, he's out there with a group of people. So what do I do? I'm me, okay? I am nobody special, and I'm not saying that as false ability. That's who I am. I am just as worthy and just as, as anybody else in this effing room. I'm just a guy up here speaking at the time. Anybody else here can be right up after me and speak as well. And so I went to him as just a normal guy, just like all pissed off with hurt feelings. And I verbally destroyed him because I can use this nice little tongue and stuff, you know, for meanness. And I was mean. I was cutting, I was biting, I tore him down. And I told him exactly how pissed off I was, how invalid I think that he was, how I thought he was worthless for his opinion, didn't matter to me. And I told him all these things around all those people. Did they consider me just another guy that was driving up who was upset and had his feelings hurt? No. Among his peers and his people and stuff, I was someone that they saw who wrote a book and did these things, totally destroying their friend, who now they thought lesser of because of that. That hurt him bad. I wronged him. That was a mistake on my part that I still feel bad about. He is still a jerk. I do not like him. I don't want to have anything to do with him. But I still wronged him. And that was my mistake that I live with. And I've actually gone up to him a year afterwards, and I apologized. It's like I didn't try to like, it wasn't one of those apologies like, well, I hope we can become friends. No, it's like, no, look, I burned that bridge. I'm good with that. Let's make the river wider, okay? I'm okay with that bridge being burnt. But I apologize, I was bad, I shouldn't have said those things. So you gotta understand the difference between being wronged and being upset. They are two different things. It's Twitter, people, let's grow up. And coming from me, that's an admonishment, okay? So let's go to the next one. Uh, let's talk about the lessons that we learned. I love the fact that I'm already going through and segue, and I'm like, oh yeah, I already said those things. Okay, so what that, what, what that said. So everyone makes a mistake, but some have a remorse or desire to correct them. You have to be able to do that. If someone makes a mistake and they come up to you and they try to make it better, yeah, you, you try to help that. You try to smooth it over. You try to, this is a community. We're gonna fight, we're gonna have disagreements. I always say, I respectfully disagree with what you have to say. It's like there are people that I am violently opposed based on their religious beliefs or their political beliefs, and they are great friends of mine. I don't have to like everything that they have an opinion on. I like them as a person. Um, never judge someone more harshly than you want to be judged for your failings. Every person that you go online and you tweet out, it's like, oh my gosh, demo fail. Or you go, oh, their program is so full of bugs, it's ridiculous. Look at Adobe, oh my gosh. I mean, okay, okay, we can make fun of Adobe. It's like, let's, okay, sorry, sorry. It's getting ahead of myself. <laughs> it's like getting too much of the rapture. Okay, like we, we still do that. So, um, but you also understand that what would happen if your failings were public? What would happen if you woke up in the morning and someone announced something that you'd screwed up? Trust me, uh, it was in October, I remember it was at night. It was the, uh, the first Friday of October. I think it was like October 7th. It's like, I remember driving home with donuts for my family from a 2600 meeting and getting the first tweets about the problem with my book. 
I didn't sleep for 24 hours or more, not knowing what to do, feeling suicidal, didn't know what was going to happen. If Marcus J. Carey wasn't talking me down, I don't know if I would be here. I was floored. It's like I was, it totally was unbeknownst to me that this was happening. I didn't know how to respond. I didn't know how to react. I literally, it took me over six months before I ate donuts again. It was such a negative association. Obviously, I've overcome that very well, okay? <laughs> but it's like, it was bad. It was a horrible time in my life. But it's like, I still need to understand that that's on them, not me. It's like you can't just take all the guilt. It's like sometimes people are just a-holes to you. It's not what you did wrong. It's just they like proving how wrong you are. So you need to understand that. Now the last one has also evolved a little bit too because uh, DEF CON 12, so I'm actually gonna be probably on time a little bit, but it's like I may run over because I'm like that. Um, so uh, DEF CON 12, my first DEF CON, I was an idiot. I came, and not for the, and, and at first, I, I, when I first started thinking about it and talking about it, I assumed it was an idiot because I dressed and I spray painted my hair blue. And I wore my shiny dragon shirts. Uh, hold on, I'm getting there. So it's like, I thought that's what, no, I spray painted. It was like, I actually, when I showered, it came out and I had to reapply the spray paint the next day. So yeah, it's like, there's images on the internet, unfortunately, of those. So. But what I did also was I didn't have any conversations with people. I had photo ops with people. I got a picture of Rainforest Puppy. H.G. Moore was dropping Metasploit with Spoon M and the gang freaking at DEF CON 12. I've got an awesome picture of them at the OSVBD party. Did I talk to them about what they were working on or what they had developed? That was a historical moment in our, in our timeline, in our history. And I'm there going, hey! You know, I didn't learn from it. And so the key part of that mistake was not how I dressed. It was not because I went in and I wasted all those opportunities. The mistake was that I thought DEF CON had to be this way. This is DEF CON, this is what occurs. This is what happens. If you come to DEF CON with preconceived notions of what it is, you're going to be pissed. DEF CON is not a conference anymore. It's, it's changed from that a long time ago. It is a conglomeration of conferences, of passions, all put under one, two roofs that you can go to and you can experience. You want to do nothing but social engineering? Guess what? I think there's a village for that now. It's pretty cool. It's like uh, if you want to do hardware hacking, there's a village for that. Lock picking, there's a village for that. Wireless hacking, there's a village for that. There are people, there are 20,000 people here. And you don't go and say, oh my God, there's 20,000 people here. You go and say there are 20,000 opportunities for you to find someone that has the same passion that you do, that are trying to work on the same kind of projects that you are, that can help you with them. And if you're not approaching it that way, you're really wasting your time here. This is an event for everyone of every persuasion, of every kind of passion, for every kind of hacking. It's not my DEF CON that I used to do, and this is how we did it. It's everyone's DEF CON with everyone's perceptions on how they bring to it. That's what we have to start learning. And I didn't learn that lesson. It took me two or three years to figure out that and when I did I stopped going to a conference and started having a family reunion with my friends and my community and that changed my life so that's what you got to have so there's nothing wrong with wanting to be around others who enjoy what you do right there's nothing wrong with that but learn what they're doing. Try to take an interest in that. Understand what's going on. Uh, one of the things that most cons is learning, so make sure that you're a part of it. You have to be learning here. I'm not saying you have to go to every talk, but you, have to, you can learn things at the parties. 
there is a speaker that's talking about all this uh, cool technology that he's just coded and he's developed. That's great. And he's speaking in front of a thousand people and he's nervous. And he's like, he's got to talk and, and explain that. You put three beers in him at a party, buddy. You're learning the old day that is how he did the chain. It's like, you're getting some info. It's like, he will talk to you. It's like, he will help educate you, teach you, show you where you can go to get more information. That's a network. And out of 20,000 people, and I put this as a bad DEF CON advice, okay? In a conference of 20,000 people, make sure you judge the whole conference on the interactions of one or two people. Because, yeah, that's logical. Okay? I, I will tell you right now, there is at least 100 people at this conference that are up to no good. They're jerks. They're not nice people. And you should watch out for them. Doesn't that leave 19,900 other people that can help you and benefit with you and be friends with you? Which one's greater? And when did we start concentrating on the, the lesser than the more? This is an amazing place. And I'm not saying that because I'm standing on this stage. I'm saying it because I mean it and I believe it when I go home and I go anywhere else in the world. I love this event because this is where my family is. So that's what that is. Now, never also, but more importantly, I know, I'm, okay, I'm going to be a little late. Let's be honest. I'm going to be a little late. I'm going to run late. I'm sorry. I'm running a little late. That's okay. He's not looking at me happy. So, but never forget that just like a dentist, you're a valuable part of society and just as well known. One of the phrases I hate the most is being called a rock star. It's like, oh, you're a rock star. You get no, I'm not a rock star. People who can play music are rock stars. I'm a dentist. I tell people things they don't want to hear. You got to brush three times. You got to floss more regularly. You're not flossing as well as you should be. It's like I'm the guy who has to come in and do repair on that breach or cavity, and it's painful. It's expensive. No one wants to go through it. And I'm the guy that everybody doesn't want to be around because I'm a dentist, right? I have nothing interesting to say. It's all the bad stuff. Like, oh my gosh, people aren't brushing their teeth properly, you know? Who's the guy? You know the guy who created Invisalign braces? He's famous. He's a millionaire. He goes to conferences all around the world, dentist conferences, talking about his Invisalign braces. He's written books. People come up to us like, can I have a picture with you, sir? I love your work in orthodontry. It's amazing. And he takes pictures. And you know what happens after he leaves that conference? He's an effing dentist. I care so little about him, I didn't remember what his name was to tell you what it was. I don't care. He's a dentist. Just like me. As soon as I step out of this conference, I'm just me. You're just you doing the best you can to make things better. There is no status in that. No one has a higher value of trying to make this place better than anybody else. And that's something that has to be remembered more than anything else. Now, I'm going to spend the, all the 20 minutes I have left um, <laughs> to ask for someone to give. I need three people to give fails. But they've got to be quick fails or he'll get mad at me. For every person that gives a fail that they've personally done, I will give you a fail bomb. One fail bomb has a book that I will be happy to sign. It's actually my book, so sorry, it may be degraded. But, um, but the other two will be for hugs, so everybody wins. Most people will want the hugs, but still, you got a chance that you may have to get the book. So who wants to share a fail? Yes. Come here and share a fail, yes. And as an unprofessional person, I didn't take it out yet, so you talk, so I grab this. Fail, fail, fail. <laughs> fail. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I am currently locked out of my router at home. And uh, I haven't told anyone because I'm too embarrassed about it. <laughs> You're in the right place to get help with that, though. Which one do you want? told a thousand people. Wait, hold on. You got you to open it up and see what it says. <laughs> It's got a big F on it because it's failed. Okay, who's next? Come on up, come on up, who's next? 
Yes. And the next person that up to this mic gets the last one. Uh oh, it's a race. Okay, so uh, I, I accidentally hit uh, disable instead of diagnose on a machine uh, about an hour or so away. Had to go and fix that on a Sunday afternoon. That's, a, that's not good. Come here and pick one. That's a fail. <laughs> It, it may be a little more epic. My first uh, red team engagement, fishing engagement, was uh, for the military. And we accidentally actually used Shades of Green, which, which if you don't know, is a Disney resort. And uh, it was the public stuff. And they wrote it to their spouses and wives. And uh, we shut down Disney for like three days. Oops. <laughs> that is, you deserve the book, actually. That, that's an epic fail. <laughs> So the key, well, it will be, trust me. So the key thing is every single one of you in here could have stood up. Every one of you made a fail. And every one of you have learned from it. And that teaching moment could help teach someone else. So stop just sharing your successes and how you've done everything right and start sharing some of your mistakes so other people that come after you won't make that mistake as well. Oh, and by the way, yes, I was, I was trolling y'all the whole time. I know I was using Comic Sans fonts. The whole talk was about fails, so there were several fails inside the presentation as well. No, seriously, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>